Hello, welcome to Flaunt, Build Your Dreams and Live Your Sparkle. I'm Laura Cheadle, and the theme for the entire month is sex. Ah, I know. To celebrate the four-year anniversary of my radio show and podcast, we are going to spend the entire month talking about sex. Why? Well, because sex is one of the most loaded words out there. It's one of the most taboo ideas out there. But if you get right down to it, think about this. Every single organism out there is a sexual being. From single-celled organisms to us, to animals, to vegetables, to everything. If you are alive, you reproduce. If you reproduce, you have sex <laughs> in some sort of a way. Now, yes, I know some cells just divide, but that is still part of reproduction. So that's part of the reason that I wanted to spend the entire month focusing on sex was to take some of that taboo out of it, to bring it back down to a human level so we can start talking normally and naturally about a normal body function. Just because a cell reproduces and it divides without having sex, it's not really different than having two animals or people come together and have sex in order to reproduce. It's different mechanisms by which we reproduce and it's just reproduction. We all do that. It's part of our normal bodily function. And the reason that it's important to talk about that, now there's other reasons too, and I'll get into that next because that's some of the sacred sexuality. But the reason that I think it's really important to talk about it is because of the amount of misinformation that is out there. Let's talk about some big things that kind of have to do with sex. Um, child trafficking, <laughs> sex trafficking, rape. Um, there's a lot, pornography. There's a lot of weird behavior in the world around sex. There's a lot of uh, cultures and religions that have got some weird stuff around sex. And to be very clear, I am not judging or shaming or putting out an opinion one way or another about any of these things. The intent with this show and the intent with the other shows this month is to provide information and to provoke thought. Above all else, I am passionate about provoking thought and sharing information around things. Now, with that said, let's slide right back into talking about some of, you know, cultures, religions, pornography, rape, sex trafficking. There's some really horrible, really bad, really warped stuff out there around sex. And part of the reason I believe that we don't talk about these things is we're uncomfortable because they have to do with sex. And if we talked about it, and we could be normal and not embarrassed and not look down and not think, shh, kids are listening. Maybe if we could all become adults and talk about these things, we could come up with some better, real solutions to problems. For example, when information is shared, it gives us a baseline of understanding among all people. So if we're going to talk about whatever it is, you know, rape or sex trafficking or promiscuity or, you know, whether it's good or bad or you're a sinner or a saint or you're married or you're not, or it's with someone who's the same sex or somebody who's a different sex, 
we all have these different opinions and beliefs and triggers. Hopefully, just in listening to this show so far, you've had a couple moments in time that kind of hit you in the solar plexus and you go, ah, what? I don't know. That's just because we don't have that baseline of understanding because we get so worried about some, what somebody will think about us if we share. Think about that. We are concerned about what other people will think about us, so sometimes we don't talk. So sometimes we don't share what we think or what we know or what we believe because we're concerned about what other people will think about us. And that is the hallmark of my work. That is part of the reason I want to dive deep into the birds and the bees and sex and taboo and start breaking some things down this month. For those of you who don't know, I am Laura Cheadle. I am a former attorney. I have turned life choreographer, which is my modality which is my way of working with people to help them overcome the need to please, overcome that fear of being judged and express themselves fully so they can find uninhibited joy every day. Now, you can learn more about me and my work at my website, which is www.laura, L-O-R-A, Cheadle, C-H-E-A-D-L-E dot com. If you go to the website, you can also download my free bundle of joy gift pack. Uh, it's an amazing gift pack. It's got a PDF on increasing your intuition. It's got an MP3 hypnotic download on how to create one positive habit. And this is the best part, considering we're talking about sex and sexuality this month. It's got um, a free download video for how to lap dance. Now, before you start thinking, oh my gosh, what is this show about? Lap dance is about getting in touch with yourself and your feelings and your feelings of joy and enjoying how your body feels for you not for another person. It's all about ourselves, making ourselves happy, making ourselves feel good, which again, dovetails right into this conversation that I want to have about sex, sexuality, sensuality, pleasure, and start breaking down some of these taboos. Okay, are you with me? Are you excited? Ah, uh, I am too. Okay, so let's go urge right back to the beginning about what I was talking about with sex just being a biological function, which it is that all organisms have, whether it's the single cell and they divide and they reproduce, or a couple of people come together and they reproduce. It's a normal biological function and we all have it and it's good. Now, that's for me where the spirituality comes in. Sacred sex. Sacred sexuality to me and to many people around the world, too, is reverence for life. It is springtime right now. That's where everything is coming to life. The planet is coming to life. Flowers are starting to bloom. The grass is turning green. The leaves are budding out. Now, I understand in other parts of the world, or if you listen to the show, that might not be the case, but wherever you are and whatever the season, you know what spring looks like. It's the return to life. That's what the whole religion, basically Easter, you know, celebrating um, springtime and the return to life. Whether you're a traditional Christian and the beliefs that, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and returned to life, or whether it's the symbolic, you know, coming to life, it's a reverence for life. And that's why sexuality is sacred and beautiful, because it creates life. And if you think about being made in the image and likeness of God, God is a creator. You are a creator. 
Yes, you can create with your hands and by making things, but what is the biggest act of creation that's possible? Sex! <laughs> Creating another human life. Sit with that for a moment, if you will. Creating life. You have the power to create life. What would our world be like instead of putting shame and taboo around sex and sexuality if we told our young people about this power? Instead of spinning that negative, don't get pregnant. This is awful. Teenage pregnancy is horrible. Sex is a sin outside of marriage. What if you get pregnant? What if we took that negative spin and we reversed the angle on that? And we said, this is the most divine, sacred thing you could ever do. You have the power to create life. And with that power comes great, great responsibility. And unless you are ready for that responsibility, unless you have a beautiful connection that is so deep and so rich with this other person that you want to create life with them and you can hold and sustain that life for 20 years, <laughs> think about that. We're not telling them, shaming them, blaming them, saying stop. We're imbuing them with the knowledge of how sacred and beautiful creation is. What would it be like? And again, I'm not here to answer some of those questions. I'm here to provoke thought around that. Could having a society where kids are raised from a young age on to understand the awe and the power and the beauty around sex because it's the way to create life. If we had that belief and we raised up our people that way, do you think a lot of these sexual problems would go away? Whether it's unintended pregnancy, whether it's pornography, suddenly urge, doesn't that shift the view of pornography too? Wow, if we want to watch people in the most sacred act to create, does this make sense? It might just shift the view around that. So that is my first nugget of thought, my first provocation <laughs> that I want to leave you with. What would it be like if we all saw sex for what it was, and we all raised our children and had that collective belief in society around this being the most sacred, powerful, religious, beautiful act. Because when I think that through, that's kind of a world that I want to be a part of. It's kind of beautiful. <laughs> And it kind of makes more sense. And again, think about that whole culture of life. People talk that our culture is not very respecting of life. And I feel like a lot of that respect comes from our disrespect. And I feel like our disrespect goes all the way back to the creation point. And again, I'm not getting into a conversation about, you know, what life matters and what life doesn't matter and, and choice. And because there's a lot of reasons for a lot of things that are up to you that are not up to me. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons for that. And perhaps, I mean, I said, we're not going to go into the whole abortion thing and we're not, <laughs> but perhaps that wouldn't even be an issue in the first place if our whole culture knew what sex was really about, which goes to then the whole rape thing. Rape is not about sex. Rape is about power. 
I'm going to say that again very clearly because I feel very strongly about that. Nobody rapes somebody because they're so turned on by them that they can't control themselves. That doesn't really happen. Rape is about power and it's about control. It's about a lot of stuff that doesn't really have to do with sex. It is the weapon that rapers use. Raping is their weapon. But how do we separate that weapon from the beauty that it is? And again, I, I fully believe there's always bad people out there and that things will happen. But again, let's think about the cultural shift around that. If, and again, there's always bad people out there. I'm not denying that. But if the raper had been raised in a culture in a community with the belief and the understanding about what sex really was and it wasn't shameful and it wasn't taboo and it was beautiful and amazing, would they choose that as their weapon of choice? Again, possibly, possibly not. I'm just provoking thought and putting it out there. So that's the whole sacred sexuality piece and the belief around what that is. And whether it's the religious beliefs around that or the cultural norms around that, I think we can all agree, no matter what religion it is, no matter what culture, that there's a lot of power <laughs> in creating a life and that there's a lot of responsibility around that. And again, maybe some of the more repressive cultures or religions that try to hide women, that try to capture and capitalize on that. Maybe if it was all out there more, some of those negative power structures would find it harder to stay alive because there was more understanding around that, if that makes sense. Now, I said with power comes great responsibility, and I want to move into that responsibility piece next, because a lot of the rules around sex do have to do with responsibility, and yes, there are things like sexually transmitted disease, unintended pregnancies. There's definitely some negative sides. There's negative sides to everything. Holy cow. I don't care if, you know, it's a vaccine. There's some negatives, there's some positives. If it's food, food can be negative, food can be positive. Everything in our world has got two sides to it, two aspects. Too much of a good thing is a bad thing. <laughs> it just always is. So with the responsibility around sex, again, perhaps if we were able to increase our comfort level around that and to talk, normally to our kids, to each other, many of those downsides would no longer exist. Now, I've done some fantastic interviews this month that I'm excited to share with you. One of those interviews, we talked about the safety of products that we use. And it was like, wow, we use products on our bodies that we know a lot about. Now that you're probably going, what? What are you talking about, Laura? If we want to be healthy, we eat organic foods. We know about too much sugar. We know about gluten. We know like all of these health things about ingesting it. We also know about the products that we put on our bodies. You know, people uh, use, whether it's organic or paraben-free, um, we don't want to rub stuff on our skin because we know it absorbs. We want our shampoos, our household cleaners. We're not using plastic water bottles, you know, because of the BPA. We're using glass. We know all of these things and we talk about it. And it's this big buzz in the media, you know, use this, don't use this. Ooh, sulfides and parabens and all. And we talk about it. But then let's, especially for the women, because I'm female and I, I know my body, <laughs> when we have our monthly cycles, we use products like tampons and pads that are bleached. The vagina is a mucous membrane. 
and it absorbs into our bodies at an incredibly rapid rate. Now we talk about not putting things in our mouth. We talk about not putting things in our skin. We talk about not putting things in our environment, in our households, but we don't talk about the products that we use on or in or around our vaginas because people are uncomfortable with the word vagina. Ah, panic. Did it make you feel weird? Did it make you feel weird when I started going there where you're going, oh my God, I don't know if I want to listen to this. I hope it did. I hope it made you feel uncomfortable. Vagina, vagina, vagina. I hope that makes you feel very uncomfortable because then you can start looking at it in terms of why am I uncomfortable around this? Probably because it's new and I'm not used to hearing it and I'm not used to saying it. And I would feel very awkward and uncomfortable walking into a room of people, friends, coworkers, family, and saying, did you know your menstrual products could be toxic because you're putting a bleached product inside your body in a mucous membrane and it's absorbing that? But those are the conversations we need to have. Those are absolutely the conversations we need to have. There's a lot of products that we use in and around our vagina, which is a large mucous membrane. And it goes right up to the uterus and to the ovaries. And we're concerned about ovarian cancer and uterine cancer, but we're too uncomfortable to have conversations about the products that we use in our vagina, which sucks all that stuff right up to the uterus and to the ovaries. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Could it be worth getting over our discomfort around our body parts to save our lives and the lives of our mothers, daughters, sisters, friends? Could it be worth that? Because to me, it is. To me, I would rather be a little bit uncomfortable and push through that and to be able to have conversations around the health of my pelvic area, whether it's my vagina or anything, in a normal way, the same way we can talk about breast cancer month in October and breast exams and say, this is how you do it and not have people be like, oh my God, she touched her own breast. Yes, and you should too. More than every month, you should really be in touch with your body. And there's no shame around the organs that we have. They are God-given organs. We all have them. There's no shame around them. We should have responsibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting all fired up here. <laughs> responsibility around how we use them. Yes. We should have responsibility around the information that we share, and that should be a high level of correct um, information. And we are being very irresponsible in not talking about it. Who out there knew their vagina was a mucous membrane? Who out there knew? I mean, think about we take, we're in the middle of the coronavirus right now. People say, don't touch your face. That's because we don't want to get things in our mucous membranes, our nose, our mouth, our eyes. We talk about that but the same thing is happening in different parts of our body and we're uncomfortable sharing it. Why? Because we don't want people to get the wrong idea about us. Does that make sense? All I'm really wanting to do is provoke you to think about what makes sense and what is just a cultural norm or idea that maybe no longer makes sense that is maybe time to retire. Maybe we should tell our kids from an early age on things about their bodies, that they don't have to go to the internet and start Googling things and getting information that's wrong. Maybe we should start talking about, yes, this is a part of your body. Yes, this is important. Yes, you have to keep it clean and healthy. And this is how. And if you put this here, it's going to absorb into your body. And who knows what that's going to do. If we wouldn't eat it, we should probably not be putting it in a mucous membrane. For all of those obvious reasons. 
and we should be pretty darn comfortable talking about it. So again, I feel like there's some kind of part and parcel here. It's such a beautiful, amazing power that we have. How do we honor? I'm huge into honoring. How do we honor that power and talk about how to use that power responsibly? When I was in law school, urge little sidebar here. When I was in law school, I was a member of the Women's Law Caucus, and we wrote a book for a service project. And the book was The Rights and Responsibilities of Teenage Parents. And I loved that book because it talked about their rights, whether it was emancipation or, you know, the right to do things with their children and all of their rights as a parent. But it also talked about their responsibilities. And the reason we wrote that book is because we felt like society was just hammering away at young people and that they had a kid and then suddenly they're young and they don't have life experience and nobody will talk about this kid and they're still in that shame and that stigma of being a teenage parent and we really needed to talk about their rights to stand up for themselves and for their children but also their responsibilities on how to do it right and that they were responsible for doing a whole host of things for their children and we i mean that book went like wildfire um a lot of the adoption agencies needed it schools wanted it it was information that was so basic and so clear, but that nobody had it. And that's what I'm trying to do in this show today is present the rights and the responsibilities of being a sexual being. And despite the fact that our culture might be a little bit weird or awkward, <laughs> despite the fact that you may have a familial or a religious or a cultural upbringing where there was a lot of shame around this, I invite you to just take a few breaths, <sighs> to open your heart, to open your mind, and to allow a little bit of shift in thinking to occur, and to just start seeing sex and sexuality in the beautiful sacred light that it is and to provide some balance with the rights and the responsibilities, the power and the responsibilities around sex and sexuality. So ah, I hope you can do that. And if you'd like to discuss that, you can always reach out to me. I am on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I've got an amazing Facebook group called The Flaunt Flock. So if you just go to Facebook and search flaunt flock, you'll find it. Um, it's a private group, but we talk about things like that. Some of the books that we have read, um, Come As You Are, I'm forgetting the author's name right now, but Come As You Are was a great book because it talks about, again, our sex organs and the wide variety and how everything is really normal. But again, because we're not talking about it, we're not sharing it, we have shame and insecurities around our bodies. Some of there, did you know there's plastic surgery for the labia? Seriously? Even though, I mean, this goes right back around into porn. We get so much of our information from looking at porn, which is a skewed view. And then we think our bodies are wrong and they're not. And the only reason we think they're wrong is because we've sanitized our culture so much that we've lost touch with what is real and what is normal and what is not. I wrote an amazing article. I will put the link in the show notes um, for Elephant Journal about naked women. And about how in other cultures, in other periods of time, we cared for our young, we cared for each other, and we cared for our old. So we were in touch uh, with what the human body looked like over a life cycle. We knew because we were there with our sisters being midwives, 
helping them give birth. If you go back to the whole red tent <laughs> era and concept of, you know, the tribes of women supporting each other, we shared with each other, you are about to go into marriage. This is what you need to know. We helped and we celebrated, yay, you're having your menstrual cycle. Menopause, not so much simply because people didn't live that long, but women were very intimately in touch with what other women's bodies looked like. This is not sex. This is not sexual. This is not perverse. This is not gross. This is us being in touch with other women and knowing what our bodies were capable and what they did. Whether it was, you know, pregnancy or birth or having your menstrual cycle or nursing or helping another woman step into marriage and know how to handle sexuality in a healthy way. It's not jumping online and looking at perversion or looking at a fringe thing or looking at a 1% of the population's bodies and then trying to compare our bodies to that. It's the normal body because again, we're all bodies and we all have these cycles and these transitions in our lives. So that's kind of this next thing that I wanted to step into is nudity. Ooh, panic. What does it mean? The show in this month is all about sex and about what healthy sex is and what it is not. So what I'm stepping into right now is the idea around nudity and that nudity and sexuality are completely different things. Nudity and sexuality are completely different things things. We can take care of our children's bodies and it is not sexual at all. I can go touch and take care of another woman's body and it's not sexual. I can take care of another man's body and it's not sexual. And we have gotten so attuned to the idea, the idea that anytime we come together in nudity or that we touch or hug or kiss, that it's about sex. And then it's perverse and it's weird and it's abnormal. And it's the idea that has brought that. It's not the reality around that. In many other cultures and countries, and I will link this show too, because it's about like the, the way that the families did it. But in many other cultures and countries, things like the steam bath, and the sauna. Families and generations go in naked to enjoy the sauna, to enjoy the steam. It's not about sex. Other cultures, other countries, you can be nude or topless on the beach, and it's not about sex. Now, that is not to say that sometimes other people from other countries come in and they view it through their own lens and they perceive it to be something that it's not. But many other cultures are more comfortable around the body than we are. I should be able and you should be able to deal with any other human's naked body in a healthy, comfortable way. I have taught fitness since 1988. That's a long time. <laughs> Every year I've had to take the CPR, the first aid, now it's the AED certification. I cannot tell you, I mean, from 1988 to now, that's a lot of years. Just about every year, I'm not going to say every year, but just about every year, when we talk about the fact that, you know, cutting the shirt open, bearing the chest to attach the AED um, device, or, you know, kneading, to touch the body, what it used to be the Heimlich maneuver, you used to wrap your arms around and do all the, you know, thrusts. Every single year, pretty much, there would be pushback around touching another person's body. Oh my God, what if it's a woman? What do you mean, what if it's a woman? She's had a heart attack and you need to bear her chest. Yes, and what if it's a woman? What if? You're honestly concerned that you're sharing, showing her breasts or that you're touching her chest? Yes. Do I need to get another woman to do that? Oh my God. What if somebody sees? 
step back from that. That's a societal hang up. That's a belief. Again, what are you saying? Same thing with the Heimlich and wrapping arms around. Oh my gosh, what if? What if I, I'm hugging somebody? I can't touch somebody like that. Wow, that's not sexual. Wow, that's interesting. Same thing with chest compressions. Well, I want to stay away from her boobs. Hmm. I just find it very interesting. And I, I invite you again to move into your beliefs around taboo, bodies, sexuality, sensuality, and just normal bodies. We all have bodies. We are all also very curious about bodies. Think about this. Think about why sometimes people move to pornography. Think about some of these images that are on the internet, whether it's full-blown pornography or not. There's a curiosity factor, and that curiosity factor is normal. We all want to look at other bodies because we're all trying to validate what is normal about ours. And we're curious. As humans, we're all curious. We're supposed to be curious. A lot of times, little kids playing doctor, it's curiosity. They've just known this little body and they want to know what other bodies are like because it's different. Think about that. Are you curious? about how different bodies look because I am. Sometimes I look at other people, people watching. People watching is fun because you look at other bodies and you're like, huh, ooh, wow, that's interesting. It has nothing to do with sex or sexuality or perversion. We're just curious. And again, in the past, we bathed each other. We helped our elders. We wiped their bottoms just like we did with our babies. We knew what old bodies looked like. We knew what pregnant bodies looked like. We knew what postpartum bodies looked like. And we helped and we touched and it was not sexual and it was normal and it was all okay. And that's kind of the second thing that I want to talk about or wanted to talk about was how can we get back to that? Now, again, I'm not saying go hug and touch everybody and forget boundaries. We do have personal boundaries and we can do that. But how can we elevate? How can we start rising above and becoming normal about nudity? Normal about bodies? Normal about our curiosity looking at other people's bodies? Would that level of curiosity drop? If it was more, if we had more access to normal naked bodies and normal circumstances. See what I mean by that? Every month in my article, please read my article. You'll love it. But every month I go to the steam bath and it's a bunch of naked women from 18 until probably 80 some. And the first time you go for the first few, first few minutes, you're like, ah, this is so weird. It's not weird anymore. It's all normal. It's all normal. And now the curiosity of being, there's one woman there who has had a, mis, um, a mastectomy. I have not seen that. It was interesting to see. And you kind of want to stare and you kind of want to look because you don't know because you're not used to it. And now you're like, yep, I've seen what a body looks like like that. I've seen 80-year-old bodies. I've seen really heavy bodies. I've seen really thin bodies. I've seen bodies in between. And it's more normal and I'm more comfortable with it. And I feel like as a society, it would be really nice to get back there again. <sighs> How are you feeling? Is your head spinning? I really hope it is. I'm going to talk about taboo and then I'm going to go into pleasure. And that's how we're going to close out this show. And then I invite you to listen all month because like I said, celebrating the four year anniversary with a great birds and bees moving into springtime theme. Taboo. Think about when things are forbidden, the forbidden fruit, they become more desirable. <laughs> it becomes a bigger thing, even though 
it's not necessarily a bigger thing. I use burlesque and the concepts of burlesque a lot because burlesque is a way to break down taboo. Burlesque comes from the root word burla, which means mockery or joke. And there, there's a lot of different forms of burlesque, but the idea around a burlesque is it makes fun of that which is right in front of us, but we kind of choose not to see. And the reason stripping, not complete nudity, but stripping out of the gloves, teasing with the boa, sliding out of the beautiful silk dress, peeling the stocking off, there is some sex appeal to that, but it's the taboo that is what burlesque is all about. We, this is my forearm. This is my hand. You can see it. This is not new. We all have forearms. We all have hands. But a glove peel in burlesque is because it's teasing and it's play. And it gets you all excited about, oh my gosh, I'm going to see her arm. We all have arms. Burlesque pretty much strips you down into a bathing suit. Bra and underwear. <laughs> We see that on mainstream TV all the time. We see that in ads, in the newspaper every Sunday. We see hands and legs and feet and arms all the time. A stocking peel, peeling a stocking. The stocking is sheer anyway. You can see the leg. A stocking peel is so sexy and burlesque because it's pushing into that taboo of, oh, you shouldn't be seeing me get undressed at the end of the night. Spoiler alert, we all get undressed at the end of every night and it's not that big of a deal. That's why burlesque is so fun and so titillating is because it leans you in to the taboo that you shouldn't be seeing this. It doesn't really give you anything more than you would normally see, but it's leaning into that taboo that makes it more desirable, more sensual, more appealing, more naughty, and ah, way more fun. <laughs> so I want you to think about how breaking the taboos will also make some of these naughty things less desirable and how we might all heal <laughs> as a culture. Now, I had mentioned like sex trafficking and there is nothing right about sex trafficking, obviously, nothing at all. But again, what if some of the taboo, what if we pop, pop that hole in the balloon and some of the taboo around sex and sexuality? What if, again, I'm not, I'm not advocating, I'm provoking. What if it was perfectly legal and perfectly acceptable for women and men to choose to get paid to sell their bodies prostitution. What if? Would that change the belief around sex work? Suddenly, if that was a normal thing and people had a healthy attitude around it, that they were providing a service for somebody that could not have access to that, would it shift things? And again, I'm not... I'm not advocating anything. I'm asking because I don't know. If that were a something that women could have access to, that men could have access to, that they could control and that there was integrity around, if strip clubs or burlesque theaters, again, were not a seedy underground thing, but something that we talked about, oh, well, yeah, that's a huge curiosity factor. And this is what I like about burlesque. Burlesque is not about body type. M many of the strip clubs are more around the stereotypical view of women. And I think this, now I am interjecting my opinion. I, I, I do think that that's what makes some of those unhealthy and not right because it leans more towards the pornography, which is the stereotypical image of what a woman should or should not look like. Whereas in burlesque, it is all body types. And then the curiosity factor does go down because then we can see, oh, wow, look at what all these normal unphotoshopped bodies look like. What if that was all on the up and up? 
What if it wasn't suppressed and kept on the down low and filled with shame? What if, circling back to the beginning with um, sacred sexuality, it is the most divine act of creation that any two people can embark upon. So what if it was elevated? What if it was normal? What if we talked about our body parts? What if we were comfortable being nude and having some normal physical contact with each other in terms of helping and assisting and cleaning and hugs? What if there was no shame in sex work? What would it be like if there was no taboo around this? Because I don't necessarily think it would alleviate all of our problems because society is not that way. But if we broke down the taboo, more people, would more people become more healthy? Would fewer people have the desire or the compulsion to move into something because it was no longer taboo and it's not the forbidden fruit anymore? So, aunt, well, whatever. Our curiosity, our normal, natural curiosity factors were satisfied. And suddenly we don't need to Photoshop bodies and we don't need to hide and we don't need, not that it would take down the whole sex trafficking industry again, but if this was normal and people had access and curiosity and it was normal and we all talked about it and everybody knew it was out there, how could that industry even stand? It seems like that it would all start healing. And again, I'm not advocating, I'm just questioning. So for the last how many minutes of the show, for the last few minutes of the show, I want to go into pleasure because I think that is the one area that shifts the biological functions and the spiritual functions of bodies and sex and reproduction. Like I said at the beginning, when an organism divides, it's, you know, reproducing. That's its sexual function. Flowers, they reproduce. Vegetables, you know, we all, seeds have to be fertilized. That's something that happens. But in humans, at least, because I don't really truly know about animals because I'm not an animal. But in humans, we have that pleasure factor. And that's a big factor. And I would be remiss in a conversation to not address that, to dumb it down, to not address that factor. We do things that feel, feels good. Sex is designed to feel good. It releases oxytocin. It improves our immune functioning. It decreases our stress. There's a lot of positive pleasurable emotions around sex. And that is what I believe is one of the reasons that it has also become taboo and that we don't want to talk about it because we're afraid that people will start seeking it out because they want that pleasure. And because of the drive for the pleasure, they will start being irresponsible around it. And we talked about teen sex and we talked about, you know, sex outside of marriage and there's all of these things. And like that, is there the compulsion, the drive for pleasure in a healthy versus an unhealthy way? And that's a real thing. So again, I don't know the answers. I'm just provoking you and making you think, hopefully making you think about some of these things. Okay. Think about this. We want things to be pleasurable. We spend a lot of money making ourselves happy. We buy things because we think it'll make us feel good. We have, think about all the things in life that you do in order to feel good. You want to go to a movie to feel good. You want to have a great conversation to feel good. You want to drink alcohol to feel good. There's all of these things we do to try to chase pleasure. But our society also has a really warped view of pleasure because we're constantly chasing it on one hand and we're also constantly denying ourselves on the other hand. If it feels good, it's got to be wrong. 
That's a belief we have. You don't want too much. Ah, enjoy it while it lasts. Think about all of the belief around we want it, but we don't. It's good, but it's bad. Well, if you, you, we think we can't enjoy our work sometimes. Oh, I would do this and not get paid for it. Like you can't get paid for something that you love. I mean, it's, it's warped. No, oh, you can't pursue your dream. You got to have a real job. What are your beliefs around pleasure, around feeling good? I know, and again, this is around my work. Think about my work. I help women let go of self-sacrifice, get over the need to please so they can express themselves fully and find uninhibited joy. Let's break down that sentence. I let go I help women let go of the need to please others, the need to self-sacrifice. I am a good and worthy wife if I sacrifice for my husband. I am a good and worthy mother if I sacrifice for my kids. What is that saying? It's telling me, Laura, put your pleasure aside, put your needs aside and do for others. Whoa. Drain yourself to the point that you can no longer function. Then you can't be there for your kids then you can't be there for your husband. That doesn't really make sense. I need to feed my own pleasure and my own joy so I can be a happy, bouncy, positive, energetic person. I can help you better when I feel like this than when I feel awful. For a moment, think about yourself when you have the stomach flu. <laughs> How much help can you be to other people when you have the stomach flu? Pretty much not. You're not feeling good. You can't help people. Versus how much help can you be to other people when you've slept good, your belly's full, but not too full, and you feel great? It's that simple. Find your own pleasure and feed your own pleasure so you can serve not only yourself, but other people too. It's okay to have pleasure. It's okay to feel good. Not only that, it's essential. Nobody wants to fall into that hedonistic place of living. I get that. But that's not what we're saying. And really, is there a danger of doing that? Think about the things that you enjoy. Would you re really, really, really do it all day long? Chances are you probably wouldn't. <laughs> Because at some point, it's the you know, point of diminishing returns. It's really, really, really great to eat your brownie and ice cream with chocolate sauce all over it. But if you have it every single day, it's just not that fun anymore. There's so many things that I love, great conversations with friends, whatever. If we talk all day, every day, pretty soon, we're like, I kind of need a break. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that we balance automatically because we know that point of diminishing returns is a thing and we want to do different things. So I challenge you to start thinking about, and this is the um, F step in find your fe in flaunt. Flaunt is an acronym. Find your fetish, laugh out loud, accept unconditionally, navigate the negative and trust in your truth. And the first step is F, find your fetish. And that's all about finding your pleasure. If you're not having fun, you're not going to be driven to do anything. Something always has to positively motivate us. Even if you hate your job, does the paycheck motivate you? Does a coworker motivate you? There's always something that we lean into that's positive that motivates us. And there is nothing wrong with finding pleasure. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure in sex. There is nothing wrong with feeling good. There's nothing wrong with leaning into that and enjoying it. But if we healthily balanced the creative nature of sex with the pleasure, how much more would that elevate things? You think about the stereotypical views sometimes around women and men and marriage and that she has to serve his needs and that she doesn't have any needs and that she, women hate it. And men. It's really warped. Bring it together in 
how can we make each other feel good? Because I love you, I want to serve you. And there's nothing wrong with that. And because you love me, you want to serve me. And there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes I will do something that I don't want to do because I love you. Sometimes you will do something that you don't want to do because you love me, but it's this mutually beneficial thing and we help and we elevate. And that's that healthy, normal conversation that needs to be had. And going back to the responsibility and the rights for maybe premarital sex or teen sex, you want this. I think it's more powerful to explain to teens or young people, or even old people, it doesn't matter, that this is a big drive. Pleasure is a big thing, and there's nothing wrong with satisfying your need for pleasure, and there's nothing wrong with moving into the fun. But make it a sacred act where you are in union with somebody, and that you are doing this together. Because it is the most powerful sacred creative act that you could ever engage in. And I do think that when we talk about it from that elevated state, it just shifts the whole conversation. Pleasure is good. We tell our kids we want them to feel good. I want my mom to feel good, my friends to feel good, my kids to feel good. We all want that. Don't hide it. Don't hide that sex is a pleasurable thing. Talk about it. Talk about it responsibly. So is catching a buzz sometimes from drinking. That's a pleasurable thing. Let's talk about it. This is fun. So is, like I mentioned, that brownie sundae. So is eating a brownie sundae. So let's talk about it. And know that if you eat it every single day, there's going to be some health consequences and you're not going to feel that good. <laughs> talk about it normally. Break down those taboos. Anyway, I am really hoping that you've got some questions that have come up. Some things that you're like, oh, I never thought about that. Hmm. How can I break down the conversation? And I charge you this month to start thinking about sex in a deeper way. Start thinking about pleasure in a different way. Start accepting the fact that you can receive pleasure. It's okay. You can give pleasure. It's okay. Step into the sacred space of your own power to create. Talk about your sex organs. Educate yourself about what you're putting on and in your body. And don't just ignore your pelvis because it happens to reproduce and that happens to be taboo. Start asking questions. Start talking. Start sharing. Start opening up and let's get rid of this taboo and see where that brings the entire world. If you'd like to talk, reach out to me on social media, um, www.lauracheadle.com. Uh, again, download your bundle of joy gift pack and let's talk about sex. Who has that song in their head? Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me because I get that song in my head all the time. Anyway, let's talk about it. Let's get normal. Let's talk about it. Nudity, sexuality, pleasure. Let's just talk about it. Let's get out of the gutter. I think the gutter might disappear if we were all able to talk about it normally. And I can't wait for you to see my guests this month. Amazing guests all month long. So enjoy it. Thank you for being here with me. Have a fantastic week. And as usual, don't forget to flaunt. <laughs>